I, I think there, there is a, you know, the category, there's, there's a difference between men and women, and, and, and men should uh, wear clothes accordingly to, to uh, their own uh, gender, and women should do the same thing. In my opinion, woman should dress feminine, and a man should dress masculine. That's the way it should go, you know. Uh, Try more to say. No, that's the <laughs> truth. You want to be in, in shape, you want to be confident, you want to look comfortable with what you're wearing, and you want to look good next to your woman. In a man has to be like type of their muscle in. The woman I like when they're walking, like elegant walking, elegant speaking, talking. You know, I get my nails done. I love to tan. I love to look good. Yeah, of course. You know, everybody especially, likes you know, I'm 38 years old and you know, I still want to look good. You know, I, I, I can't see men wearing dangling eardrops that come down you know, their shoulders. Her like little sister always teases me that I'm metrosexual. I, don't, I really don't know what that means. What do you think it means? Um, I think they think it means I'm half gay because I like to look good and I like my hair done and my nails done and my eyebrows mm -hmm. done. You know, you gotta look, man, you can't be too obsessed with the manicures and all of that because that tends to be a little fun. To women like rough. I've come home, my wife goes, oh, I love you looking dirty, but, you know, that's what it's all Beautiful about. Look. I don't see why men have to go around looking uh, dressed like women and I don't see why women have to go around dressed like men. My name is Fred Gorski. I'm alias Rainstorm. Been here for mm, probably 30 years, very close to 30 years now. I do makeovers, he to she makeovers, uh, basically um, cosmetically changing the look of men that want to become female for a short amount of time. A lot of great clients that come in that, that basically can't really go into Bergdorf's or Macy's for a, uh, a makeover. A couple of ex-Jet football players, a couple of uh, um, fairly known actors, uh, a couple of Navy SEALs. They're all gamuts, all gamuts. There are people that do come that want to eventually have a sex change. Uh, people that come and uh, they are completely heterosexual. Um, people that come and they're married and their wives don't know or their wives do know or girlfriends. A lot of the job and what I really loved about it, a lot of the job really has to do with where their head is at and trying to help them out with their, what their role really is, you know, what they really want to do and um, how they should go about doing it, helping them to make the proper decisions. So my vow as a as a pagan priest was to send me the people that need my help and that I can help them with only with the stuff that I can help them with I can't teach people how to read or teach people how to do math but I can teach people how to be happy and I can teach people how to love and accept themselves and portray themselves in a positive way without saying gee I'm really sorry but I'm it's like you know you need to really have no shame in the game walk you through the house and show you some of the things. In here is where I, uh, my main hall basically. This is my uh, jewelry room. I have lots of different kinds of jewelry. Big, big gaudy stuff to make a big boy look like a little girl or feel more glamorous. Over here I have bracelets. 
really difficult to get. Most of my braithers all start with a size eight inch wrist, which is very, very hard to get. If you ever look in uh, a lot of your catalogs and stuff, you'll see seven, seven and a half, even seven and three quarters, but you'll never get an eight, eight and a half, nine. Some of us have some pretty big wrists. Over here, I usually do nails. So when people are having their nails done, they can sit right here in a stool nicely. And they can just put their hands up there and I can be on the inside where all my polishes and tools are to do nails with, which works out kind of nice. And here I have all of my shoes, one of every shoe that I have in stock. And this is my wardrobe room. These are all evening gowns. Every size from a small up into a 4X. These are all cocktail length. And some of these go up to a 5X. These are bridal gowns in here. Some of my bridal gowns, because we do bridal sessions. This is all fetish wear over here. So you have lots of, uh, lots of nice fetishy things. Vinyl and stretchy, cool bondage. It has, so you can wrap your arms around and you can hook them in the back. Jackets, little shawls, cover-ups, shrugs, things like that, because a lot of us have Big shoulders, hairy arms, tattoos. So it's a good for an all over cover up. These are just all blouses of all different kinds and all skirts of all different kinds. And then over here we have some lovely made uniforms, French maids, lovely things. All pretty, flouncy, and all crinolines on the bottom. Tops here we have a lot of lingerie, fetishy lingerie, garter belts. You know, you're, you're a little more feminine than average garter belts. So you have lots of pretty things going on. This is cute. This is uh, a little sissy girl outfit. People like to dress up as little sissies and do that whole thing. And then here we have the salon. This is where all the magic happens. This is, this is the wonder of uh, fantasy land. We have makeup. I have a sink so that if we want to do your hair, we can give you a roller set or a permanent wave or anything. I'm completely licensed with hair and makeup, so I can do just about anything. Uh, wigs of every sort. I pride myself on my wigs simply because I can rearrange almost any wig into any style. I can take something like this and I can cut it into something as short as this if I wanted to. You know, so a lot of times people will come to me and say, you know, I hate this wig, I bought it and it's just too long, I can trim it. It's just too curly, I can straighten it. It's just too straight, I can curl it. I can do just about anything. This is one of my favorite spots. It's a great place to do photos. I take people and I bring them in here with their nails all done and do like something like this. It works really well. This is really nice for a background in here for pictures, especially if you have light hair. We uh, have a lot of guests that come in from out of town, out of the state, and even out of the country. We've had Istanbul, Russia, the Netherlands. This is one of the rooms that we, we rent out for overnight or the weekend sometimes. Unfortunately, I had no maids in tonight. Usually I always have uh, maids volunteering coming in, French maids and uh, we do some um, bondage and discipline. With naughty girls and naughty boys sometimes. We go right over there. Where is my next client? Rita, you here? Come on in, Rita. What have you been doing all day? Nothing. Nothing? Raking leaves. Raking leaves? Yeah. Look, you're filing your nails. Doing the driveway. Oh. Stuff like that. Alright, let's get you going. Let's make you into a pretty lady again. Yeah. I know I can. My name is Rita Petit. Rain. Rita? What would Madam like me to do today? You see, every Saturday I come here because I'm I'm a maid. I come and I dress up like this and in heels I vacuum and dust two floors, or sometimes more than two floors, plus other jobs too. 
Okay, I'm Barbara Wire. I uh, occasionally work for uh, for Rain. Um, I'm a dominatrix uh, when I work here mostly. I also entertain uh, clients, uh, show them around the city, um, get uh, some of Rain's clientele comfortable with uh, their new feminine self. I'm Sylvia, I'm from New York City. Amy. Hi. Can you just uh, introduce yourself to us? Uh, your name? Nicole. Where are you from? Sun Al. Okay, and uh, what do you do for a living? Construction. I went to a, went to a Catholic school up until the um, oh, fifth grade. And then finally they said, you know, you, you really need to take them someplace else. <laughs> it's like way, way too disruptive. It was a, a small beach town and, and there was just like all sorts of summer businesses and there were bungalows to the left of us and to the right of us. I'd say that we were probably a four block, four square block neighborhood. And um, in that four blocks, we had five bars. And you could always find your parents because they were always in one of those bars. And if they weren't there, there was always everybody else's family there that was drunk or getting drunk. That was the way we were brought up. You know, was it um, dysfunctional? Hell yeah. <laughs> the world is dysfunctional. But it was very loving. It was very caring. Unfortunately, you know, to be gay and to be a feminine and to be a little sissy boy and pretty, it's like it was not the right thing to, you know, because they'd have people drunk at the bar and say, what the hell is the matter with him? He looks like a little faggot. Uh, he looks more like a girl than a boy. My father would get off of work. He was a bartender. My mother was a bartender. My father would get off of work at one bar and go to the other bar to meet my mom. He was a hardworking man. You know, she was a hard worker. We didn't come from much at all. I, I quit school. They, uh, when I was 15, I, I talked my dad into sending me to, you know, to a trade school. I wanted to go to hairdressing school, but he said, absolutely not. There are too many funny people in hairdressing. So I said, okay, uh, I'll do barbering then. It's close enough. And he says, all right, barber school I'll send you to. So he sent me to Atlas Barber School on 42nd Street and 9th Avenue. Oh my God, what a thing to do to a little gay boy at 15. It was a six month course, took me a year and a half to finish. There was always a dozen men on the corners that wanted to say, hi, how are you? <laughs> I was all too willing to say, I'm fantastic, try me. We used to, um, there were two friends in my neighborhood that used to dress up with me. Uh, we were probably oh, 15. We would go out on the highway and we would walk up and down the highway with scarves. We didn't have wigs, so we'd put a scarf on, turn it like that, and a big bulky sweater or a coat, depending on how cold it was. And we'd just like wiggle up there, you know, with a little lipstick on and stuff, and the guys would stop and beep, like, come on, you want to ride? And then we would run, never thinking that suppose the guys came back to the neighborhood or, or suppose the guys walked over to us, you know, or suppose one of these guys in a, in a car stopped and like pulled us in or something. It's like the danger of the whole thing, especially way back then. I think that when my, I made my real decision, I was probably, I was 16, sweet 16 party. It's like, I, I think probably if I would have came out four years earlier, I don't think I would have survived. You know, it was just when people were like growing their hair and, and, and you know, free love and kind of stuff like that. And, and then people were just like, you know, oh, he's a hippie. I, you know, we pr pretty much disliked each other almost to the point of hating each other, my father and I. And so, you know, he finally found out that I was gay, which was wonderful because it made us finally talk to each other about the real deal. You know, like, look, you're what you are and I'm what I am. And I am every bit of you. I am as a stubborn, obnoxious, strong-willed, and I will get exactly what I want, the way I want it, just like you. You gave that to me. It's like, accept it or don't accept it. That's your problem, not mine. What's that? Nikki, pretty. Beard line. Imperfections in the skin tone. Ever since I was a little boy, part of me was a girl. And in fact, it's my family that gave me the name Rita. Because they said, ah, oh, Rita's a sissy, little Rita sissy boy. 
But at the time, I thought it was fun. I thought it was great because I was. I was a, a little boy and had a high voice, and I'd rather play with Barbie. And I was deathly afraid of baseballs and footballs. I had two sisters and a mother, so I know I was. I remember taking their stuff. So it started very young, and it was mostly uh, initially it was stockings. Don't know what the fascination was. Never went to see a uh, psychiatrist to find out where that came from. To, don't care. <laughs> I enjoy it, so I do it. I mean, I've dressed before since I'm a little child. I wore my mother's stuff and all that. But the first wife liked me to dress up, and she liked things like that. And role play. And uh, I took to it, and you know, I, I haven't, I don't do it often. I have very busy schedules, and when I do do it, it's you know, it's you know, just makes me feel different, different. And I don't say I look like a feel like a woman. I don't. I don't say I. I don't know what I say, but I, you know, it's just different. It's therapeutic, actually, for me. Yeah, no, this one. Yeah, no, that's... my sisters used to dress me up. I was uh, young, so they're to blame. It's not me. I've always been a woman who arranges things. It's my duty to assist the Lord above. I've always been a woman who arranges things like luncheon parties, dinner dates, and love. This is uh, something that I've been doing since I was pretty young, ever since about adolescence. Since I'd have to say since. Uh, about 12 or 13 years old and uh, basically I found that uh, it was something that aroused me. I just found that I was really interested in uh, trying on uh, women's undergarments and that type of thing and um, it just, I, I felt uh, a type of rush, a type of sensation. I don't know what percentage of me is a woman but it's there so because when I'm a man I have very feminine traits, because this is my real voice. I don't change it when I become Rita. And I'm very emotional, I cry easily, and as a guy, sometimes that's not the best. But as a woman, I can do all these things that I would normally do and not hold back. I was 17, and I was sneaking into a gay bar here on Staten Island that was in St. George. It was called the Mayfair on Hyatt Street, and that's where I met my first group of really outly gay friends. And then we met, we met Winston, who had an apartment right down the street. Winston was having a, a drag party, and that was the very first time that we went out in drag, seriously. And then I had my mom make me a dress. She knew at that point everything, so my mom made me a beautiful gown, a black satin gown with a fishtail bottom, and, and white ostrich feathers around the bottom of it. When, when I was doing shows, I was very fiercely proud of being a man and being able to switch off and have people look at me on stage. I stripped and I belly danced, but they always announced me as, and now we have a female fantasy. People A, don't listen to what the name of the person is, they don't really care, and then B, after it's all over with, they understand, and C, I'm not trying to lie about what I am. I want them to think that I'm a woman until I take off that last article of clothing that's the bra and then pull a wig off and I had no chest and no hair. I had short hair at, the, at that point. Another gay club on Staten Island had hired us to do some shows there and that's when Lucchese's picked me up. On Highland Boulevard it was Lucchese's House of Seafood and the owner, Dick Lucchese, contacted me and said, you know, I've heard about you and I'd like you to do a show here. I did my first show and he was like, that's it, I want you here all the time. So I did every single holiday, Christmas, New Year's, Mother's Day, um, everything, everything for him for, I think it was about a two year run. And at that point, a lot of other places in Manhattan had picked up and, and called us in. It did a lot of funny songs, you know, funny acts and stuff. You know, we always backed it up with like three or four people that worked with me all the time. It was kind of like at that time, we were out of the 82 club age, out of the, um, the when they had the big folly kind of cross dresses, 
people just didn't have it any longer, and you were into more people getting up on stage and lip syncing, you know, to, to, to songs. She feels pretty. And it was, uh, it was fun. It was a whole lot of fun. So all of a sudden, one day, I had this amazing amount of clothing and, and stuff, and um, then I bought the house and said, you know what? It's time to get my feet on the ground and go into the real world. And I had my first salon already. And um, I bought a second salon, I bought the house, and it's like I packed everything away and said, ah, you know, I can't do this no more. I need to be a real businessman. I need to go back into the real world and have people respect me and, and respect myself for being able to run a, a real business out there. And I did that, and it worked out really nice with two salons, and I got all my respect, and I still never denied who I was or what I was. Rain was actually the first professional um, makeover that, that happened for me. So, and then Rain taught me how to do my own makeup. And taught me everything I know, really. Well, I've been coming here probably about 10 years. But I stopped and then recently I started coming again. And been doing it you know, more frequently. You must really like the work that Rain does. Oh, yeah. Pretty amazing. Speaks for itself, yeah. I think. Men will come here for their opportunity to be transformed into a woman, have the joy of taking pictures so they can remember it, and then go back into the salon, get everything scrubbed off, everything taken off, put back on the rough guy clothes, and leave. And they've spent those couple of hours and just who knows how much happiness, fulfillment, just all around fun, just, and then they can dress the way that they want. You want to be a maid, or put on the wedding gown, or do you want to be an absolute nasty slut? <laughs> Whatever, just do your fantasy. And Rain does that, and I see them, and they're all having a blast. I met Rain, uh, and have been coming to Fair Play for several years now. I uh, found out uh, about Rain through the internet, and uh, made an arrangement to uh, make an appointment with her for uh, a makeover session. And I really enjoyed the type of work that she did for me. It feels sexy, it feels nice, you know. It's, I mean, look at me, <laughs> I'm almost pretty. Yeah. <laughs> well, the services we provide are basically um, just visual services where we can, you know, we can do everything visually. We can block out the eyebrows, we can raise them. Um, you know, we can g give a little bit more of a lift to the eyes and the cheeks with tape, um, then cover all that over with cosmetics, you know, so that we can change their features as much as we possibly can, change their body features with, you know, foam rubber and, and corsets and breast forms. I guess in the time that I grew up, it was glamour, was the high glamour and fashion was a, was a big thing, so... Um, it's like I really got into it, you know, when I started working and performing, it was always like six shades of eyeshadow and lashes out to here and, you know, all that crazy, crazy stuff. I usually, when people sit down in the chair, I ask them, you know, like, what kind of a look are you going for today? And a lot of them will say, well, you know, I want something that's extremely passable, not too much makeup, something that is, if I was going out in, in a, you know, the mall, that nobody would, you know, be shocked at me and look at me and take notice. I want to blend in. Other people will say, well, I want a real slutty look. I really want to look slutty. I had somebody just the other day say to me, I want to look like a drag queen. He was in from um, England, actually. And it's about his sixth, sixth make over here. He comes quite often. This whole place is like, it's a school. It's a college of feminization. <laughs> and anytime I have questions about anything, I come and ask Rain. And part of the good thing about being a maid is that if I need anything, I say, Rain, really, I'm trying to find a good corset that works. Do you have anything? I just say, sure, come on into the salon. We'll try on corsets. And she'll say, you like it? It's yours. It's perfect. I know Freddie. He was... um. My brother's lover, they were, that's how I met Freddie many years ago. And like I say back then, being that, you know, my brother was gay. You know, coming to know him, I came to terms with it and just that, you know, it was all right. You know, it's it, they loved each other very much. And he moved out, my brother was about 16, he left home, he moved in with Fred. Alex 
man, he could he could just bring worlds together, and that's and that's he had this amazing capacity to do that. He was just so gifted in so many ways, and when he got out of hairdressing, well, well he was still in hairdressing school. I bought the salon in St. George. That's that's stepping into a whole other world when you went to that when you went to that salon. That was Fred's domain. And as Fred was the mass producer of the place, Alex was the attraction. But it was a great, great business. I mean, uh, they learned a lot about doing hair and different styles. They had a big plate glass window, and all the people would walk by on the street, and Alex would be standing there, and Fred would be at the register, and it's like she, the, the girl would look in the window just for a minute, and they would just look, and they'd be commenting, going, oh, my God, drag her in here. She needs it really bad. Look at what is on top of her head. Is that a rat's nest? I mean, his first salon was, you know, it's in a section in Staten Island that was basically like old ladies getting the uh, blue, blue dye hair jobs, you know, <laughs> getting their hair all teased out and everything. And, he saw the opportunity with the second shop. People would go there, and it would be some kind of combination of getting, I guess, getting your hair done or making yourself look good. But you would come out of there not only looking good, but in amazing ways feeling good about yourself. It was more like family than, uh, than actually a business between the, all the staff and the clients because you, you had your regular clients that come every week, and everybody knew everything that was going on. And that's the scary thing about op stepping through the doorway when Fred opens the door. It, you walk into a world that invites and allows you to be all of who you are. You know, you know being a, a, a gay man or a gay teenage boy, and you know, I was always hanging out with older guys, Fred and other friends, because I was able to go places. Because really on Staten Island, there really wasn't anything going on. You could see the tolerance level of like the gay community or transgender or transsexual is still very on the, the down low. The, the funny thing is too, like they used to have, my brother loved to throw parties, him and Freddie up here, we used to have parties and um, there were people that I knew like in other families that were gay and they didn't really come out. And I said, well, you know, why don't you come to the party? And, and you know, after that, they'd feel comfortable, they were around other people. Like I say, Staten Island, I mean, it's not Manhattan. A friend of mine used to refer to Staten Island as David Lynch land. <laughs> It's like, not, as, not everything is as it seems on the surface. Nobody's very comfortable about being themselves out here so much as going to the city or uh, maybe in, in Brooklyn or Jersey, you know, somewhere that's not so close to home. When Alex first got sick, um, Zach ran the, the salon and um, I told him that I wasn't going to come back until he was either dead or he was better. At that time, too, so many people that he knew and I knew had passed away from AIDS. It was at that time where a lot of people were passing away, and people, you know, weren't having safe sex. And so within like a couple of years, a lot of people I knew had passed away. He was diagnosed three years, and um, he got sick six months before he died. But um, he was great up until then. Fred was spending a lot of time, you know, uh, with Allie and the shop started to kind of slow down the business, losing clients. I was very angry because, of course, my brother and I was losing him, but I was a little angry with my brother too because they kept it for me for years when he was sick for numerous years and they didn't want me to know. It's like in the night before he died, we were all here around the bed because he was getting really, really bad and we were like just doing poetry and, and just singing to him and just talking to him and he would slip in and out and in and out. It's, and I, I never let go for a moment. You know, I, I said, you know, he's, he's not going to die. He's going to pull through. No, he's going to be okay. I'll hold him on a little bit longer. He'll be okay a little bit longer. No, it's not time yet. And it's like, you know, I went in that day and I looked at him and I said, you know what? It's time. You know, I loved being with Alex 24-7, you know, for 15 years. We worked together, we vacationed together, you know, we even made love with other people together. It's, it's like I, I never wanted him out of my sight. It's like, and he never wanted me out of his sight. And that was a wonderful thing. And that's why 15 years was a wonderful 15 years. I, I was married and getting divorced, but 
I just realized that I'm getting older and this is what I want to do. And I just had a feeling that I didn't get any other way. And I uh, just like that feeling, so. I'm much more mellow. I seem to relax a lot more. I was married for seven years and then Wow, I think she was, my wife was downsizing or something, but I got let go. I fought it like heck, but she said, no, I want to be divorced. And we had a one-year-old child and a nice house in the suburbs with two cars and everything was paid for. And she was a stay-at-home mom and I was working. So, wow. But it ended up happily. My son is happy, well-adjusted, two loving parents. My dream was to be in an opera orchestra because I adore opera and the whole symphonic literature. I don't know which is more fun, playing in an opera orchestra or being a girl. Hmm. I'm bisexual. Been all my life. That's Learned awesome. it in the Marine Corps. <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed dressing in clothes like this once in a while, but mostly out. Yeah. Oh, you're just a, what do you want to call it? Slave to my desire? <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Life's too short and you might as well live it and enjoy it. That's my philosophy. I used to go to a, a regular female dominatrix myself. One night a friend of mine who was into S&M said, you should be the dominant one. I said, no, 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 I really like, you know, somebody to control me because I'm always high-powered and very, uh, very controlling. And I want to break from that when I go to see a dominatrix. I got to talking with Rain one afternoon and I said, I'm, I'm very good with rope and knots and I can do bondage very, very well. I said, I, I, I kind of get aggravated because, you know, nobody puts the intricacy into it that I do. So, well, why don't you do it as a, as a dominatrix? And I thought about it, I said, well, I'll give it a shot. And it, it turned out well. It's, it's, you know, I haven't had, to my knowledge, an unhappy client yet. When I cross-dress now, even, um, there's an excitement that comes from in here. Um, there's a proudness. Uh, there's a, um, a camaraderie with my mother, I feel. In paganism, there are, are times that we shapeshift. You know, I'll, I'll turn around, I'll be doing my makeup, and I'll brush out my hair, and I'll look into the mirror to see if my hair is all right, and then all of a sudden, the shift will take place, and I'll realize I'm my mother. I'm my grandmother. I'll realize that in spirituality, the ritual that I'm creating is creating because it's love of mother, grandmother, womanhood, um, glamour, power, creativity. I was always a very confident male, but as I get older, um, I kind of lost that confidence. When I started dressing, I got it back and you know, I just had a lot more fun. When I was a child, I think it made me feel sexy. Um, as I grew older and became a little better at it, um, I actually feel more confident. Um, it, it, I feel more natural when I'm dressed. Dressing is, is just something that is like, you know, if you're a man and you put on a Rolex watch or you put on a fine Armani suit, you feel good. If you're somebody who, you know, just enjoys feeling feminine, you put on a sexy dress, you feel feminine. I'm not out to people who know my male side. Um, I work as a male. And so uh, for people who know me as a male, this would come absolutely as a complete surprise. Uh, as time goes on, though, I find that I'm becoming a lot more comfortable with this side of myself. And uh, eventually, um, I suppose that there are people within my inner circle that will find out and will know. And uh, 
hopefully they'll be accepting of it. And um, I enjoy both this side and my male side, but uh, this side is a lot more intense and I really enjoy this side that much more. passed away, it was like, what do I do now? I, I feel like a half a person, like, I guess anyone else that would be a widower or a widower, you know, you feel like a half a person, like, you know, I didn't have no children, so it's like, you know, I, what do I have next, you know, and then the business was right down the trash, so I was like, now I don't have a business to be my life. Yeah, I said, you know what, let me put an ad in the paper for um, waxing, men's body waxing, because men don't like to come into the salon, they feel funny doing stuff like that. People started asking me, do you know anybody that can do cross dressings, makeup for me? I said, yeah, I can do it. And they said, oh, great. And I realized that a lot of the men that were coming in for body waxing were cross dressers. I, I, I hooked up with a couple of different cross dressing papers and I got a little bit of, of um, notoriety by, you know, underground newspapers on cross dressing and stuff like that, some mistresses that I knew sent people to me, brought people to me that wanted to be cross-dressed and then dominated by them. And, and, and we started building up a little bit of a clientele with cross-dressing as well as waxing to the point where I, I, I hired a couple of more guys to work. I hired a couple more girls to work. It's like, and you know, you could pretty much put it all together and figure out the whole thing. It was like, a, it was a very nice lucrative business and we were all having a whole lot of fun doing it. It's a new life. It's a new life. It's different. It's different. It's a whole different headspace, you know, and all of my friends know all about Alex and my lifestyle prior to this and what I was, what I did and everything like that, but there's not room to constantly dwell on it. I was out doing some work on the front of the house and three cars pulled up. Doors opened up from all sides of the cars men running out. I said, my goodness, this is a great day for business. And one had a crowbar. And I said, excuse me, what's going on? It's police, you better open up and we'll break down the door. I said, the door is open, come on in. I'll put on the coffee, the licenses are all on the walls. I was walking across the street one day on my block and I had the newspaper in my hand and I read about this raid and when the address, when I got to the address, but I know that address, but I know that, it, and I'm standing in the middle of the street. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And of course, it was my friend. To make a long story short, um, they ended up taking me down to the police precinct and said that I was operating without a massage license and that I was advertising massage. I'm not in the business of judging people. I might not understand it, um, and that's okay. But people are entitled to make adult decisions about their adult lives. We went to court 13 times, and 13 times the prosecutor wasn't ready to prosecute, so they dismissed the charges, and that was the end of that. And I told him, I'm not coming to your house anymore. You know, I have a reputation to, to protect. It was about 10 years after I was arrested that the advance came to me and said to me that they had seen an article that was done from Playboy Channel, that from the Sex Cetera show that did a, 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 a scene here of me cross-dressing a couple um, to somebody that worked for Playboy told someone that worked for Time Out magazine, or was it New York, New York Times? And with that, um, Village Voice named me one of the, the best place in New York to have a cross-dressing at. With that, um, I think the Staten Island Advance grabbed it and said, wow, look at this. And they put me on the front page of the Staten Island Advance. It just moved to all different places so that I was lucky enough to get the notoriety for it and, and, and to get a little bit more respect <clears throat> in the community for what I do now. Kitchen. <clears throat> I believe the package is on the floor. Suntan. Suntan. Okay, got it. Okay. 
going to a convention tonight? Uh, right. From what I understand, it's a fetish convention, and it's being held uh, at a large, very large place, uh, somewhere in New Jersey. And uh, there are going to be all kinds of people there. Going to be male, female, transgendered, uh, variety of people, into a variety of different scenes. A lot of cross-dressers or, tr or transgendered people that have it tough. To me, if somebody found out about me, I wouldn't give a fig because I really don't have anything to lose. I wouldn't lose my job and I'm not married, but there are a lot of scared girls out there that are so fearful. I got, you know, these are not stick-ons, they're, they're regular nails. I go to the Home Depot. You know, they look at my nail. I hand the gas station attendant a credit card. I'm dressed as a guy. Oh. You know, they get all freaked out because they don't, it's something that they don't understand. The fact that I started cross-dressing never entered the equation of whether or not I was considering sex reassignment surgery. Um, you know, that was something that I've always felt inside. I'm definitely going to do some, some work on my face for uh, more feminine uh, features. I don't ever see myself going all the way with sex reassignment. I could possibly see myself um, getting implants. Don't know yet. I really haven't, I just can't make up my mind about it. Um, there are some enhancements that I plan to make. They're gonna be subtle enhancements, uh, sort of to feminize certain parts of my body and that type of thing. Uh, but uh, I certainly uh, really don't consider uh, uh, conducting a sexual reassignment surgery uh, in the future. That's, that's not what I'm thinking about right now. Pull the pants up, girl. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is, they're, they're like low riders. Oh, okay. But, um, I know, that's why this shirt should be a little bit lower. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you just put this, uh... Sure, let me just draw this stuff. All right. Hang string on. in the back. I like both parts of my life. Great. I think if I showed up on a job like this, first off, probably nobody would know me. Um, yeah, that would, that would definitely be the truth. Do you worry about that? Are you concerned about people finding out about this? Oh, maybe on a job, but you, you know, right now, I'm at a point in my life where I really don't, I don't care. I, I'm happy with who I am and I'm not hurting nobody. So, I mean, if, if it happens, it happens. Would you ever consider completely? Oh, no. I'm not. Doing it full time? No. I think you're definitely born with the desires, and I think it's how you hone those desires along with your life that make you what you want to be. I think a lot of cross-dressers find that they cross-dress simply because it's a facade, and you need that facade up. And as that facade is up, you can get more comfortable with yourself. And as you get more comfortable with yourself, you can start ripping away pieces of that facade until all of a sudden there's no facade there any longer and you are what you are. That I didn't, you know, I don't feel like I'm trapped in a, woman, in a man's body. You know, all that stuff. It's like, you know, maybe it's true for some other people. It's not true for me. I'm not making fun of people that feel like they're a, you know, they're a woman trapped in a man's body. I'm not making fun of it. You know, I'm just trying to say, for me, it's not that way. My body, this is my body. You gotta push it, you gotta pull it, you gotta tug at it. You gotta tuck it and convince it. What I'm wearing right now is a gaff. We have them in a couple of different uh, styles. This is not the most attractive gaff that there is. But because it's a square, squared off boxer, it kind of holds all those puppies in. I feel much more powerful, more in control when I am dressed. Um, not that I feel less, you know, I don't feel powerful at all if I'm not dressed or not in control at all. But I feel more of it, there's more of a, um, a fine tunement I think even. I would even say that probably when I'm dressed, I'm more relaxed, which is an oddity because it's like at times I look at it and I question myself. It's like, why am I more relaxed 
dressed. I mean, I have all this stuff on, I have this makeup on, my hair is done, and it's like I can't scratch my eye, and I can't, you know, go like this, and, you know, and yet I feel far more relaxed. Voila! We have a waist, and we have hips. Even better than a waist, we have hips now. Whereas before, because a man's hips are usually only three inches larger than their waist at the most, whereas women are usually 10 inches larger. So one of the big things in creating a feminine looking body is to get the hips up there. And you know, we can do hips that are made out of rubber and stuff like that. I have those. But if you can get away with not, then don't. The less to wear, the more comfortable you are. So I prefer to do it this way. You need to know how to balance and, and walk a little smaller steps, slower steps, uh, be, a, be a little bit more confident and assured of where you're going and how you're getting there. It's, you know, as a man, it's like we can just fumble right through and it's okay. But when you're in heels and you're in pumps and you're, you know, stockings and everything, every movement has to be nice. And, you know, you need to be soft. I prefer a long line bra because it makes it nice and smooth. Once again, it's not as pretty as in the days when I used to strip with cute little bras and things like that. But if you're out for the night and you're gonna keep your clothes on, most of it at least, you're better off with something like this. And if you have a good bra, and it's a little bit tighter than normal and a good corset you can start pulling all this all the skin and muscle and flab up and in and as you've seen there are no hormones no silicone no fat deposits other than the natural but look at it how you can pull and tuck and coax a lot of people come in and have done fantasy role play, B and D, um, different things like that uh, before they've cross dressed, and then they've gotten into the cross dressing. Um, some people come in and they do the cross dressing, and then they evolve into a different role play kind of thing where they want to be a French maid and they want to work as a French maid, or they want to be an everyday passable cook or a housekeeper, and I'll do that for them lovely silicone breast forms and all of these things I sell here the breast forms the bra the corset gaff and look at that it's not amazing you get a little talker in the center It's just a whole fantasy thing. I kind of like, I deal with it as best as I can, but it's difficult for me because I'm kind of like, kind of the person that's reality. I love reality. Anything that I've ever dreamed of in a fantasy only lasted for a very short time before I made that become reality. I think I told you, I, I, I'm not sure where we left off last time, but you know, you, I think I'd let you know that I was headed full time. I was going for top surgery, then my family, you know, found out, not my immediate family, but my extended family, and they found out about everything and put me in a mental institution for seven days. Now I'm a little, you know, a little short of the money for the top surgery, but I did get some bottom surgery done. I went for castration. I'm very happy about it, um, but uh, it, there were some complications, um, hematoma, that kind of thing, healing. So it was a little bit of a rough uh, recovery road, but after now I'm pretty much fully recovered. Several reasons I wanted the castration. Um, 
A, to stop testosterone. B, when I'm dressed up, it's, it's a little easier to hide everything when you don't have that extra um, junk. But most people that I've talked with, and I've, t- I've talked with probably 10 to 15 transsexuals who've, you know, post-op, they can't achieve an orgasm. And they're never going to ejaculate again. I can't give that up. You know, after the surgery, everybody was very upset with me. For a long time, I didn't have a lot of support. But um, now I guess things are starting. They know I'm serious. I lost the support of my, um, my extended family. My sisters pretty much disowned me. My mother is... Um, said, well, you're my son, I'll always love you, but has a lot of trouble with, you know, the whole idea. My wife's known about it for 20 years. My daughters found out about a year and a half ago, maybe. Big blow up at first, but then not so big of an issue. Their biggest concern was, oh my God, well, you're never going to make the full change. And at that time, I was like, no. Um, my wife's biggest issue with me is that she really doesn't want me to get breasts. I could probably live with her dressed as Barbara with the fake breasts and continue to be married. It's a lot to throw throw 20 years of marriage and you know away over something that I can achieve just by you know creativity. The only reason I haven't made the step so far um, into just full, blown out, you know, living as Barbara is not because I'm not sure of it. It's just, you know, it's love for my family. That's always been the mental struggle that, that I've had. I love my daughters. I love my wife. This hurts them. And I know that. Yeah, it's it's selfish of me to want it so quickly, but it's also selfish of them to go like, hey, we're comfortable with this. Yeah, I mean, there's always the the downside to it. I'm a bit of a risk taker and I just, you know, I need to pursue, you know, this whole lifestyle. It's just, it's who I am. I think now it gives me more pleasure than, than, than um, the cross-dressing and the um, being able to change people's looks and their persona and, and teaching them how to walk and talk is really getting down deep within them. And the point of it is a lot of people do come you know, for counseling. You know, so I, I really love the idea of my job being able to do that. With me, I know, you know as a child, I can look and I can say pre- Pre-pudescence, I was a pawn for the world. It's like they pushed me, they pulled me, they told me, they toyed with me, they hurt me, they destroyed me. As soon as I reached pubescence, I flatly refused to allow any of that to take place. When trouble came my way, if I couldn't talk my way out of it, I'd, I'd have to get out of it some way. Thank God I've always found the right way and gotten out of it. It's like I refuse to have my freedom taken away from me. I refuse to have guilt and shame and pain in the game. It's not, not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And it's like and I'm, in, I'm in a rose-colored world that I've created where I, I sometimes don't get a, a glimpse of what's going on out and about, you know, because I put myself in safe spaces, and that's my job to take people to safe spaces. So I'll go out shopping in the middle of the afternoon, cross-dressed with another cross-dresser, you know, to Manhattan, to the village, you know, but we get nothing but smiles and acceptance and stuff like that. But I'm putting myself in the, in the proper place. And I forget that if you're going to go down, say, if you lived in Park Hill or if you lived in, you know, Noodle Up, it's like you're not going to get that kind of a reception. I really don't know where the future is going to take me. Um... I certainly feel, probably like a lot of people, feel like I have a lot of things left that I want to do. You know, there, there's a, a, a gay um, community center starting up here on Staten Island that I'm hoping 
to get involved with, and I would really love to work with senior citizens and youth, as well as alternative spirituality. It's like, I really have to say that I've been very lucky and I've worked very hard with all that luck. I've worked very hard to get myself to a situation where I feel real comfortable with myself. And um, I'd like to pass that on. I've totally grown up on Staten Island and I'll probably end up dying on Staten Island. And I'd like to leave something on Staten Island that, that people could remember me for. You know, fair play is a wonderful thing for me. It's a wonderful, it was a wonderful journey getting here. It's like, but I'm sort of feeling like um, I'd like to move on to something else next. And I'd like, to, I'd like fair play to grow in other hands. People seem to say that I helped them a lot with my conversation. Um, being pagan, you know, scrying and reading cards and crystal ball and, you know, whatever it might be. My gift seems to be talking to people. Hopefully this will go into another area and what becomes of the next phase of my life is wondrous to me. I love transvestites. I love them. I love them. I, I would. I sometimes I even go out to gay clubs. The whole world can know. I love hanging around the transvestites. I think they're they're they're, they're, they're very special people. You know, they, they put on performances. They good good. They give good. You know, give good entertainment. And they're very friendly people. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I know who I am. You know, I'm not gonna. You know, I would never go with another man. But I don't mind. You know, if I went out to a club with my friends and we had a good time just watching it. That's me. That's my personality. Secure in your own and no homophobia. <laughs>